Um, so I'm here with Geoffrey Edwards, who is Emeritus Reader in European Studies. Um, Geoffrey, can you start by just describing your area of expertise for us? Well, I teach in Europe and the world, European foreign policy, um, and I work on European security issues, European diplomacy, and that sort of area. Mm. And um, in terms of what the EU you think has done well or not so well in that field? I think one has to remember that Europe began as a peace project in reconciling France and Germany, and I think it's done extraordinarily well in that area. And I think it has reconciled a good number of former enemies, Poland and Germany and so on and so forth, um, or Britain and Ireland. So I think in, in, in offering the forum for reconciling those sorts of differences, Europe has, the European Union has been extraordinarily important, and I think that role continues in terms of attempting to resolve problems in former Yugoslavia, the Balkans, and so on. I mean, it hasn't always been successful, of course. I'm trying to win consensus among 9, 15, 27, 28 member states. Not always easy. But I think it does still see itself with this role of crisis management, of trying to prevent conflict, and so on. At the same time, I think it's important to remember that the European Union is one of the biggest donors for sustainable development. Um, and that has that's an end in itself, of course, but it also has, has the advantage of attempting uh, to try and prevent conflict um, insofar as it, it's, it, it, it's pushing for sustainable development and therefore attempting to prevent the collapse of states and so on, um, which has been a critical part in terms of attempting to do something at least uh, to, to, to meet the threat of terrorism. Mm. So there have been various strategies and so on in terms of countering, in terms of countering terrorism. Um, not always, as we saw in terms of Paris and Brussels, not always particularly effective. Uh, one of the interesting things about that has been the reaction of the French and Belgians in so far as they now reckon, realise that they should have actually been uploading more information to Europol and so on that other people could have access to in order to prevent free movement of criminals and so on. Um, and I think the value of that has been seen by uh, Mrs May in terms of the British opting into that um, on part of Sir John Scarlett, former head of, of MI6, uh, reckoning that, that it's, we're, we're much safer being able to use the intelligence provided by the other member states, as well as, of course, retaining our, our privileged relationship with the United States. Mm. So I think over a whole gamut of foreign policy and security issues, um, the European Union has been an important actor, even if constrained by the fact that it has to win a consensus among very different sorts of countries. France and the UK might well reckon that they have a global projection of power, Germany is never quite so sure. Germany is, remains convinced that um, there should, it, European Union is better as a civilian power rather than with any, 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 any other accoutrements. But on the other hand, since 2003, there have been over 30 missions um, as part of common security and defense policy. Um, okay, so they've been small, most of them have been civilian, uh, but they have been useful. Their usefulness has been recognised by the United Nations, which quite often calls upon the European Union to actually participate in peacekeeping operations and so on. So the, the European Union does have this important idea of being a, a security and foreign policy actor. And that, I think, is important for the United Kingdom. And in your view, are there things that the EU is doing that couldn't be done by a body like NATO, for example? Oh, yes, because, OK, so during the, the late... 20th century, the beginning of this, this century, that there, there, there were moves on the part of NATO to try and civilianize in some ways, uh, simply as, as a match in, on the part of the Americans who have always been vaguely suspicious of, of, of the European Union having any military dimension. But on the other hand, I think the European Union has taken up this idea that in order to be a peacekeeper, then they need to have access to the military resources of, of the member states, that they need access to those civilian dimensions that, that NATO has nothing to do with. And the European Union, significantly, I suppose, really, without America, um, can have a role in areas where NATO cannot. But we don't have an EU army yet? No, nor is there a prospect of one. 
and we've been involved. And one of the interesting things about our group was that with the support of the German um, uh, academic exchange service, uh, we had a, um, a, a workshop a few weeks ago uh, with people from the ex European Union's external service on the European Union's global strategy. Um, and at no point was anybody thinking about a European army. Uh, this is a figment of, of Bernard Jenkin or other Eurosceptics' mind. So in terms of the referendum, um, either a vote to remain or leave, what impacts might that have upon this field? I think if we leave, um, I think then we have a very weaker voice. And I think this has been made clear by Obama, by the Chinese, by the Indians, by everybody else, that membership of the European Union has a multiplier effect on, on, on Britain's voice, uh, Britain's effort um, in, in, in global politics, in, in global security. So I think we'd, we'd lose that, and that would be extremely serious. I think, too, given, given what I've said about um, the increasing use of Europol and, and Schengen information systems and so on, we would, suffer, we would have to negotiate another opt-in, if you like, um, among many other opt-ins, um, in order to have access to, 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 to um, information useful for, for con convicting criminals and so on. And how easy do you think that process would be? Because some people would say, well, anybody's going to want to swap in. Yes, um, but it's going to be one of a series of negotiations. If we come out, we have to renegotiate the whole trade relationship, whole relationship in terms of services, the whole relationship in terms of security, the whole relationship in terms of uh, countering crime and so on. So the whole series of negotiations then has to be undertaken so that we end up, in a sense, presumably rather like Switzerland, negotiating 50, 150, whatever it is in terms of, of the number of agreements, and negotiating with 27 member states. Now, one of the contradictions, I think, in, in, in the Brexit case is that we've been held back by having to negotiate at 28, um, forgetting the fact that negotiating at 28 gives us tremendous power insofar as it's a market of 28 and uh, 500 million and so on. Um, but if we are out, we still have to negotiate with those 27, each of which will have on major issues a veto. So you might well be able to say that the Germans, of course, would want to continue to trade with us, or the French want to sell us cheeses. But other people don't have so much trade with us. And many of them will be considerably alarmed by the consequences of our leaving for the future of the European Union. And I think, therefore, they will take a fairly tough position. So each of these particular individual negotiations will be seen against the background of us absolutely weaken, actually weakening the European Union, giving succor to Le Pen, giving succor to, 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 to a good number of other populist parties who might well see um, the, the end of the European Union as, as, as the better option for them. And if we vote to remain on new ah. terms... Then it depends on the majority, of course. Um, at the moment, we have the best of both worlds insofar as on, on foreign policy issues. Um, if we don't reach consensus, we still have the option of going to learn. Um, on security issues, again, if we, if we cannot get agreement um, at 28, we can still go with individual partners among the Europeans or with NATO and so on. So from that point of view, we do have the best of both worlds from, from, from a foreign policy security position. Um, but what's happened over the past couple of years since a referendum was on the cards, what we've been doing is losing influence. That we've been negotiating, we've been talking always with, the hand, with one arm behind our back, as it were, simply because can you be relied upon to actually carry this out? given the fact that you have all these people behind you continuously carping about leaving, can we actually trust you to do what you actually think you might like to do? So I think we've lost credit over the last year, 18 months. Um, now, if we stay in and with a reasonable majority, then we could really begin to focus on all those important issues like Syria, like Russia, and so on. Not necessarily being able to resolve all these issues, but at least engaging in a way that could be more proactive, whereas we've been reacting 
and really non-participant in half these things. Mm. And so is there one kind of key message that you'd like to see better communicated on the lead-up to the referendum? Yes, I think that without Europe, our voice would be considerably weaker, both in terms of foreign policy and security policy. We would be much less safe out of Europe, out of the European Union. Thank you very much.